Good afternoon and welcome to What Matters to Me and Why. I'm Vanessa Gomez Brake, the Associate Dean of Religious Life. What Matters to Me and Why re represents a creative solution to an important and often unrecognized problem in the university setting. It's the separation of intellectual life from the personal and spiritual issues. The Office of Religious Life began offering this series nearly 20 years ago. It offers the Trojan community the opportunity to hear from USC faculty and administrators in a very different way. Rather than lecturing on their area of expertise or research, we invite speakers to share their life journey with us. Today is the last event in our fall series, but we have a very exciting spring series lined up for you. In addition to partnering with the Levin Institute for Humanities and Ethics, our spring series will also be co-sponsored by the Performance Science Institute, the same folks who brought Brene Brown to campus just a few weeks ago. So please be sure to join our, my, our mailing list so you can hear about the lineup first. There is a sign-up sheet at the back there um, where you can get on the list. Next semester, as many of you know, Ground Zero will be closed for renovations, so we'll be changing our venue to Tommy's Place, USC's underground concert venue, located at the Ronald Tudor Campus Center. You may want to show up a few minutes early if you haven't been there before, as you'll need to navigate to the basement via a stairwell or an elevator on the south side of that building. Also, I want to mention that if you'd like to nominate a member of the USC community to speak at a future event of What Matters to Me and Why, please visit our website, orl.usc.edu. And additionally, you can visit our website or our YouTube page to view all the past um, speakers and the, the recordings of those, of those talks. Today, we will be hearing from Kelby Harrison, the di director of USC's LGBT Resource Center. But before I introduce Haley, the student who will be introducing Kelby, I want to take this opportunity to tell you just about a couple events uh, coming up in the spring. January 17th, 12 p.m., that will be the first of our What Matters to Me and Why event of the spring semester. So mark your calendars, 12 p.m. at Tommy's Place. That same day at 7 p.m., you can join us at the Ray Stark Theater in the Cinema School, where we'll be hosting the famous Reza Aslan, who will be speaking on his latest book, God, A Human History. So, uh, one reminder, um, after Kelby's presentation today, we will open it up for questions and answers. Please raise your hand at that time if you have a question for Kelby, and we'll run a microphone over to you. That way everyone can hear what you're saying. Also, if you haven't yet, you can grab a sandwich at the back. Please do. There's plenty of them. Feel free to go back for seconds. And now onto our main program. I'd like to introduce Haley Videkis. She is a senior in the Social Science and Communication School, majoring in political science, and she's so excited to be graduating in May. Haley? Today, I am particularly honored to have the opportunity to introduce an important leader here in our USC community, a leader who I hope someday all of you will be able to personally meet. As I stand here today, I am so grateful to have experienced firsthand the compassion, encouragement, and altruism of Kelby Harrison. More importantly, if it wasn't for Kelby's fundamental belief to support those in need, even when that means extending friendship to strangers, I would not be standing here before you today. This spring semester, I will walk across the stage to receive my diploma, an accolade that was unimaginable to me until I received support from Kelby. My fiance, Leana, and I had a very difficult experience at our previous university, and we left in a place of fear and hopelessness that we both together could thrive in an environment that was inclusive of our relationship and safe for us to finish our education. In 2014, Leana and I were forced to give up our basketball scholarships and drop out of school after our sexual orientation was revealed, and we became plaintiffs in a litigation, both seeking justice and fighting for equality. Not only had we left this Christian university feeling rejected and broken, but we had lost both of our faiths on the way out. 
It was the end of 2014, and I remember sitting with Liana alone in our apartment and dialing the number to USC's LGBT Resource Center. Miraculously for us, that was the same year Kelby began serving as the center's director. In the very first few minutes of speaking to Kelby, I knew that she was someone very special. As Leon and I introduced ourselves, we quickly found her biography on the university's website and thought to ourselves, wow. She not only had completed her PhD in ethics, gender, and sexuality from Northwestern University, but she also was an ordained reverend with the Metropolitan Community Church, an LGBT-focused Christian denomination. I read of Kelby, she is committed to the spiritual health and expression and full inclusion of LGBT people in all faith traditions. And throughout my experience with Kelby, her commitment to inclusion has remained unbroken, from the times I had given up on my faith to the times that I was secure on my own spiritual path. As both a mentor and a friend, she has reassured me that I could still follow my faith while loving who I love. Now, several years after that first phone call with Kelby, I walk into USC's LGBT Resource Center to see the phenomenal progress she has made. Since she joined USC in 2014, the center has expanded to nearly triple the size and increased the number of student staff by three times of what it once was. Kelby's efforts to build community and leadership among students in the center ultimately led to the newly established second professional staff role of the center supervisor. She helped acquire, design, and resource the very popular Lavender Lounge, a safer space for LGBTQ students, and she even helped paint the rainbow wall herself. Kelby heavily fought and advocated for the multi-stall, all-gender restroom next to the Resource Center, creating a more welcoming environment for transgender and non-conforming students. Kelby has trained hundreds, if not thousands, of USC employees, staff, faculty, and students on many topics, including LGBTQ cultural competency, and in the spring of 2017, she implemented and led the semester-long 1,000 Crane Project in efforts to heal from the homophobia, transphobia, racism, and other prejudices of the Trump administration. Nonetheless, Kelby's advocacy for her students does not stop at the edge of USC's campus. For Leon and I, Kelby's support extended so far as to attending a very important hearing for our case at the federal courthouse in downtown Los Angeles when our families were unable to be there. For many students, faculty, and staff, Kelby has been and continues to be a universal support, providing a space for all, whether they are in crisis, in a need of a shoulder to cry on, an ear to listen, or a heart to understand. No matter how difficult the journey or how long the road, Kelby restored my hopes through her mentorship and limitless faith that USC was a place that I could heal from my past and continue to pursue my own dreams. As a visionary in her field, Kelby's efforts inspire the generation of today, but also ensure that our USC community continues to move in a direction of fostering diversity and inclusion, one that we may continue to be very proud of. Please join me in welcoming Kelby Harrison. And now, don't you all wish you were here to hear Haley and Liana's What Matters to Me and Why? They have an amazing story, and they've been such a gift to me in this job. I'm quite a bit shorter than Haley. Hold on a second. Outside of my work at USC, I'm training to be a spiritual director, which is the practice of being a compassionate listener and companion to others as they seek to articulate and live into their own spiritual understanding. Writings about spiritual direction in the Christian tradition go back to the fourth century. Um, it was mostly practiced in monasteries and convents, and its roots are strongly rooted in the Catholic contemplative tradition. But spiritual direction, as a form of spiritual companionship, is also intertwined in the history of Judaism and Sufism. In my training, I've been taught that why is not a spiritual question. Why is a question that will lead you down the rabbit hole of psychology. Spiritual questions are where, where, when, how, and what. 
So let me give you a quick Freudian style answer to the why part of what matters to me and why. I'm sure it has something to do with my parents and our dynamic. So mom, dad, if you ever watch this video, I'm sorry for how difficult things got when I was in my 20s. I know now you did the best you could. And of course, Freud would also tell you that why, my why, has something to do with sexuality. Um, so I'm the center director of the LGBT Resource Center. So obviously. Okay, great. So the why is answered. Um, so I'd like to talk about the where, the when, and the how before I answer the what. Um, the where happened at the UCLA Santa Monica Medical Center, where I was training for five months as an interfaith chaplain. This was about a year before I began working at USC. So training as a chaplain in a hospital is called clinical pastoral education, or CPE. In many traditions, to be ordained, you must complete at least one unit of CPE, which is basically a 20 hour a week semester. A small group of trainees are in a cohort together, and we all begin to see patients immediately. So some who are on their deathbeds, some who are in for a health crisis, others who'll have surgery and then heal completely, and then my favorite, the neonatal unit where visiting a patient just met holding a tiny baby. So we would respond to the spiritual needs of the situation and stumble through as we learned through group didactics and supervision that we have a lot of work to do on ourselves to get out of the way in order to just be present, authentic, and responsive, which is way harder than it sounds. And the gravity of the conversations are sacred. They're both easy and they're also overwhelmingly difficult at the same time. All right, so let me backtrack a little to tell you how I ended up in a unit of CPE. Um, I completed my PhD in philosophical ethics, gender and sexuality at Northwestern University in 2010, intending to be faculty for the rest of my life. That had been the plan since I was 16. And I landed this incredible job right out of graduate school, teaching ethics, a philosophy of religion, and LGBT social ethics at a liberal and social justice seminary called Union in New York City. And it's the kind of place that just breathes social justice. It espouses liberation theology and it demands activism. It's a place where the students confront the professors about the number of scholars on the syllabus who are people of color before ever seeing the syllabus or ever considering your class. And you better have a damn good answer. It's also a place where if you only use masculine words for God, you can receive formal sanction, even as faculty. And I loved it. Ethical thinking came alive in the classrooms at Union, where students were preparing for leadership roles to change faith communities, nonprofits, and then ultimately the world. But my contract with Union was only for two years. And when there was some talk about keeping me for a tenure track position, my lack of religious credentials was raised up as an issue. So I decided to get ordained to be competitive for a tenure track job there, which is an absolutely horrible reason to get ordained. So God got her revenge at the UCLA Santa Monica Medical Center. So the win is a little harder to pinpoint. Over those five months in the spring of 2013, I experienced a transformation that changed how I view myself, the world, and what's important. In theology, there's a concept of time known as kairos, and it's a word borrowed from the ancient Greeks. So you have kairos and chronos, and these are the two different ways of understanding time. Chronos is the root word of our chronology. So it's like the 11 a.m. meeting, followed by the noon meeting, followed by the 1 p.m. meeting, followed by the meeting after the meeting. My colleagues know all about this. Where Kairos means something more like the opportune moment. It's when something critical changes. And the biblical definition is the appointed time of God. But that phrase scares me a little. So. Let's just say that Kairos is more of a spiritual time measure than an Outlook calendar. And there were conversations during this time that I had with patients and with my CPE supervisors that undid everything my ego was holding on to as my self-definition. Which then leads me to the how. So one of my patients early on in the training was a tenured professor at UCLA. And I spent a few hours with him over multiple days he was in the hospital after a cardiac arrest and waiting for a triple bypass surgery. 
And we spent almost all of our time together talking about his research and career. We also spent some time talking about my research. We also even talked about the theory of chaplaincy. We were completely in our heads together. We were talking about intellectual life, and they were really fun conversations. I really liked him, and it was clear he also enjoyed spending time with me. But I could tell that he was experiencing this abiding anxiety, which he'd only let us briefly discuss. So finally, the night before his surgery, with less than five minutes left in our visit, he opened up about his fear. His father had died on the operating table at a time when they had no relationship. So his father left the world without the two of them reconciling. In addition to the anxiety, there was a lot of anger. And we had less than five minutes to do spiritual work together, even though we had spent hours together discussing fun intellectual topics. My bad. I wasn't a very good chaplain yet. And at the time, I really only felt safe connecting with people through my head. And this Bruin was a great match for my comfort zone. If we had talked solely about his spiritual health, I don't know, maybe we wouldn't have spent much time together at all. But this conversation woke me up to my academic ego. It's the part of me that spent so many years trying to be smart and trying to convince everybody else that I was smart, even though I always felt like I wasn't smart enough. And then choosing to be in the relationships and environments that valued intelligence above everything else. The only problem was I no longer had an academic job and I was out of that world. And I didn't know who I was outside of it. And I don't want to be the kind of person who would miss the opportunity to talk about what's actually important before a major surgery. Not long after that, I worked with a very sweet patient. He was a man in his late 50s with an advanced lung infection. And he'd been struggling with COPD for many years, but this newest infection brought with it a sudden rapid decline in health. The first time I met with him, I asked him, how are you feeling about the prognosis from the doctors? And he said to me, well, I'm going home one way or another. He was a man of deep faith. And he was saying that he was either going to go home to his family or he was going to go home to God. His wife was in the room during this conversation and she cried and my eyes filled with tears. A few days later, the man's adult children and their spouses had also gathered. And he was intubated and unable to speak, so the family asked for me to come into the room with them and say a prayer for the man. We all suited up in yellow robes and gloves and masks to prevent any additional infections for the patient. And we stood in a circle around him, all holding hands. So this was my first public prayer. And I must confess, I was nervous as hell. And I have no idea what I said, none. Although the prayer went on for some time and many people in the room cried and I left just after, totally overwhelmed by the sacred invitation and the incredible trust that this family offered me. So I took my experience to my CPE supervisor, Tim. I asked, how do you not let an experience like that alter who you are? Like, how do you hold on to that humble experience of sacredness and not let it make you feel too powerful or personally important. Tim knew me pretty well by this point in the semester, and so I contrasted this experience of being the representative of the sacred for this total stranger's family with a recent breakup of a serious relationship because the woman was too ashamed of her sexuality to let me around her family after her mom had fallen ill. And Tim responded. He said, Kelby, the question is not how do you make sense of being invited into that sacred space of community and trust. That's your right as a beloved child of God. That's your humanity richly received with its divinity. The question is, why have you been mistreated and exiled from other spaces where you deserve to be received? And how do you make sense of that and not let it change who you are? It was one of the most empowering conversations I've ever had as a gay person, because finally this distinction of worth and shame were completely visceral to me. And I knew what it felt like to be valued and wholeheartedly included versus shunned and cast aside. And it taught me how to value myself more. It was a way that I didn't even recognize I was devaluing myself. And the insight was additionally surprising because it came from a cisgender heterosexual man. The patient went home to God just a few days later. This was the first patient I cried over. 
my eyes filled with tears that evening during rush hour on the 10 while I was commuting from Santa Monica back to Echo Park. So I had plenty of time to sit with my emotions and my thoughts and I did not like it. This was the first time really I had cried in a very long time and these tears started a flood of tears that over the next couple of months um, just released. And these were cleansing, purifying, holy tears that I eventually learned to accept and ultimately be grateful for. So throughout all of this time in CPE, we're pressured to get out of our egos and into our vulnerable truths. And my defense mechanisms were starting to come down, but slowly. Both CPE supervisors had noticed I wasn't talking about something in my personal history, something that clearly was still impacting my spiritual and emotional health. I wasn't talking about it because I truly thought and would have said at the time, I'm okay, it's fine, I'm fine, it's over, I'm moving on. And then, suddenly, one day, something happened that I can only describe as soul barfing. Feel free to ask questions about it afterwards. I started talking about this trauma that had happened during graduate school. It had been years prior, and there was so much to say. It felt like there was this veritable well inside of me. And what began was a hard journey towards healing, of seeking out support groups, safe people, books, workbooks, websites, and advocate, and counselors to make sense of what had happened years before. I talked about it with my CPE supervisors, who were incredibly supportive and insightful beyond all expectation. And each day, before I would make my rounds to work with patients, I would visit the hospital chapel and ask God to hold on to my inner work so I could tend to others. And then at the end of the day, I would stop back by the chapel to pick up what I had dropped off. During this time, I met a patient, Paul. Paul was a homeless man who was dying from alcoholism. He was tied down to the hospital bed to control his tremors. He was clad in tattoos and a blue bandana. He was in his 40s and he appeared strong. He was white and were it not for his medical complications due to alcoholism, he was also good looking. So as a middle class young woman from the Midwest, I had been raised to be afraid of people like Paul. And so I walked into his hospital room mindful of my discomfort. We talked. He told me his story how he started drinking at the age of 12 to cope with an abusive family, how his wife and young children had died in a car wreck while he was in prison for robbing a convenience store. He had a tell of a lot of pain, and sympathy was easy to come by for him. I ended my first meeting with him by putting my hand on his leg near his ankle to demonstrate that I wasn't afraid of him, mostly trying to convince myself. In CPE, you're required to write about your reactions to patients and to bring those reactions to your group supervision uh, because those reactions tell you a whole lot about who you are and almost nothing about the patient. I had a lot of anger towards Paul. I felt like he had thrown away a life, that he had wasted privilege as this white, good-looking, heterosexual male, privilege that so few of us have. And I worked on that anger before I went back to see him again. On our second visit, Paul was scheduled to leave the hospital the next day. The doctors had only given him a limited, limited time to live, and there was very little they could do to reverse any of the damage from the alcohol. And I asked him where he was going when he left the hospital. He told me he was headed to Santa Barbara to pick up a liter of vodka and meet his friends on a corner. And the response that came out of me totally surprised me. I said, you don't want to do this anymore. It was a simple mirroring that felt to me to be connecting with his deep sadness and his suicidal intentions, and I couldn't believe I'd said it. Like, shouldn't I be encouraging something else, like sobriety? His eyes filled up with tears. The energy in the room changed. It became emotionally intense, and inside my head, I was thinking, if he tries to attack me, I'll just scream. I'll scream, and the nurse will come. Everything will be fine. And then the energy completely softened in the room. As I was preparing to leave, I asked if there was anything I could do for him, and Paul said to me, just please, please just take care of yourself. And I cried. And I put my hand on his lower leg again, and this time truly in warmth, and I said, I will, Paul, and I will in part because you've asked me to. I still think about Paul from time to time. It felt like he gave me his last spark of life. And my CPE supervisor validated that my simple mirroring of his emotional truth probably meant I was the last person to authentically connect with him. 
Over the months that followed, as I struggled to heal from the trauma I was dealing with, especially during the dark times, when I'd experienced the urge to numb the pain any way I could instead of working through it, I would remind myself of Paul and my promise to him. So spiritual health, according to the model used at UCLA Health, is a movement towards empowerment, serenity, acceptance, reconciliation, belovedness, fulfillment, hope, humility, and openness. I didn't tell you you'd have to take notes. Um, but this includes a moving away from helplessness, anxiety, denial, protectiveness, pride, despair, shame, estrangement, and emptiness. And at the start of the training, I decided to chart my own spiritual health every day, uh, since I was expected to do the same thing for my patients, so it seemed like a good practice. And I quite literally built a line graph of my soul over a three-month period, because academic habits don't die even in the spiritual life. And once I started talking through my emotional truths, both the current and past, all of my graph lines started to go up, especially my line of reconciliation. I was finally reconciling with myself, which meant all of my relationships could be better. Okay, so it's time for the what of what matters to me and why. What matters to me is tending to the truth of that still, quiet, place within. Thank you.